first thing is what is the age of the patient and age of the onset you know certain diseases the onset like you know 0 to 5 years this dysplastic hips that is the onset 5 to 15 years adolescent coxavara or sleep capital epiphysis then of course 15 to uh, around uh, 20 25 years all this secondary arthritis or uh, due to you know fracture dislocation or rheumatoid arthritis still about 40 years and beyond 40 years what you say is a primary osteoarthritis of the hip Though we do not see much of primary osteoarthritis of the hip, we see mostly secondary osteoarthritis of the hip. And tuberculosis is an extremely important condition in our country to back, groin or there is a knee pain. Most of the hip pains they radiate down to the knee pain. That is because of the common nerve supply. That you know Hilton's law, that is a femoral nerve, sciatic nerve and as well as obturator nerve, all three nerves process the hip joint and knee joint. That's why any pain in the hip radiates to usually to the knee. So if the patient, especially in the child who complains of the knee pain, then you must examine the hip rather than examine the knee. If you see that knee, there is no finding, examine the hip carefully. So front, back growing, and especially night cries occurs in inflammatory arthritis like tuberculosis. No, night cries, why? Because there is lack of muscle spasm. During daytime, the patients have the, the people have muscle spasm that keeps the joint you know, apart, like the acetabulum of the femur apart, but at night when the muscle spasm is relieved, there is a rubbing of the bone and that causes pain. Now limping, you must observe the patient when the patient enters the clinic or the patient is entering or the way the patient is coming towards the bed, just observe the patient, the limping, lurching, what you tell is a painful, I will tell you a little bit detail about when we examine the bull, otherwise, you know, they tend to go into spasm, even when muscle spasm is there, you cannot examine the patient properly. So, dress, patient should be dressed enough to cover the private parts and take a hard bed rather than a soft bed where you cannot assess the deformity properly. Patient should be examined on the hard bed and often you have a skin marker to mark the anterior super relaxed spine on the bony landmarks. And remember when there is a female patient, you should see there should be a sister standby. For uh, you know any orthopedic examination, it starts with the inspection, palpation, movements, measurements. Last, the special test, gait. And at last you must examine the spine and the sacroiliac joints as well. So if you remember the order, come to the first part, it's inspection. We will we'll tell you details again when you are presenting the cases, but it is a broad outline which I am giving out to give you an understanding about the examination of the hip. So inspect the patient from from behind and both these sides. Okay, that will give me, uh, all the idea I will tell you in detail. In standing as well as in supine position, that's why when the patient enters the clinic or enters your bed. So in standing and supine position and from top to bottom, totally you inspect so that you may not miss any other finding. Sometimes the examiner says you have a hip case, but there may be something in the elbow and uh, patient having a you know, flexion deformity of the elbow. Then the examiner may tend to ask, have you examined this? Because it's a long case, you are supposed to examine the patient in detail. So from top to bottom and look for attitude, swelling, mass, scar, sinuses or is there any visible deformity. You must remember what is the difference between attitude and a deformity. I will just tell you uh, in detail a little later. So from the front as you can see in this, in this patient, what you see in this patient? There is little forward bending of this patient. Only from the inspection you can. When the patient is bent forward like that, there is a possibility of ankylosing spondylitis in the mind. And as you can see here, the lie, right knee remains at a lower level compared to the left knee. Okay, so probably there is a abduction deformity in that leg. So from the inspection, many things you can know. So attitude and alignment, so look for the fixed deformities. Anterosopral leg spine, knee and ankle, just see the levels, observe that whether it is remaining at the lower level or at a higher level, whether there is wasting of the muscles visibly wasting, adductors and quadriceps, you can pretty well you can judge if there is a gross wasting of the quadriceps muscle. And swelling, scars, kinos, it can, it can be visible, you can see that. From the behind, you have to look for the, is there any scoliosis, is there any lateral curvature of the spine, both posterior superior leg spines, gluteal folds, wasting of the gluteal, hamstrings and gastrocnemius. So all these muscles wasting, you can observe from the behind. One word of caution here, sometimes you know flattening of the buttocks, you may think it to be wasting, but if there is a flexion deformity, there is a obliteration of the gluteal fold or loss of the gluteal fold, that appears to be a wasting. So be careful about this word of caution. So these are small points when you observe gradually all the patients, you will get to know about this. From the side, 
you need to see if there is kyphosis lumbar lordosis increased lumbar lordosis what is the attitude of the hips knees and ankles as you can see here there is a flexed attitude of the hip as well as the knee so there is a possibility that there is a flexion deformity of the hip or there is a flexion deformity of the, of the knee or there may be both flexion deformity of the hip as well as with flexion deformity of the knee so you need to examine the knee that whether you know knees are free so this is the inspection when the patient is standing position when patient in supine position then you have to see the attitude what is the meaning of attitude attitude of hip knee and ankle attitude is of the entire lower limb whereas deformity pertains one particular joint so entire lower limb what is the attitude whether it is externally rotated whether it appears to be certain whether there is it is internally rotated whether there is a flex so attitude is the entire lower limb in what position the patient tends to keep if you have not touched the patient without touching the patient in what position the patient tends to keep the limb whether there is increased lumbar lordosis as you know there are if there are fixed deformities in the hip then that tends to get compensated with the spine deformity so compensated lumbar lordosis when there is a flexion deformity that will tell you when i talk you about the movements and if there is a coronal plane deformity like abduction or adduction deformity there may be scoliosis in the spine so then you look for whether both anterosacral axis are at the same level or any side it is down or up at this stage you can present it that just anterosacral axis on the right side appears to be at the lower level or at a higher level here you are not confirmed because patient might be sleeping in what position so it is appears to be at a lower level and see the position of the greater trochanter or the greater trochanter is more prominent on one side or other side that you have to see on inspection next you look for the scarpus triangle there might be fullness in the scarpus triangle when there is a abscess or you know there is a cold abscess there there may be scars or sinuses in the thigh you can look for the wasting and look for the position of the patella position of the patella tells you about the rotation of the limb whether it is internally rotated or externally rotated uh, that will tell normally the position of the patella is about 15 degree of external rotation normally so if the patella is facing directly towards the rib then that means there is some internal rotational deformity okay so normal it is 15 degree external rotation in the calf you have to look for the wasting look for the malleolus whether they are in level and what is the direction of the malleolus and level of the heels also so you can tell the limb appears to be certain from the inspection though it after examination you can confirm that it is certaining is there so here you have to use the word appears to be in inspection next step we come to palpation and in palpation the first thing you look for the warm or local rise of temperature where you see for the local rise of temperature you look for the in the scarpus triangle there on the back of the forearm or back of the hand you see because back of the hand is more sensitive anywhere you have to look for the local rise of temperature you have to look for the on the back of the hand and always compare with the normal side when you do palpation first to on the right on the normal side then you compare on the affected side whether there is a local rise of temperature or not the second point what you see in the palpation is a tenderness okay i'll tell you about anterior joint line tenderness and all uh, in the next slide in the tenderness and is there any scars if it is there so when you look for the tenderness besides the anterior joint line tenderness you look for the lymph nodes you know sometimes the examiners tend to ask you that uh, what are the lymph nodes around the, in the hip examination remember there are three groups of superficial lymph nodes there is a superficial you know superomedial superficial and there is a superolateral superficial and there is a inferior superficial so these are three groups of superficial nodes and this is the deep inguinal nodes a deep external iliac group of deep nodes hip joint drains to which group of nodes anybody deep external iliac group of lymph nodes so you have to see that deep lymph nodes for hip joint okay so it remembers it is a pertinent question some examiner tend to ask where does hip joint drains to which group of lymph nodes have you examined those lymph nodes then you confirm the findings on the inspection next we come to anterior joint plane remember it is extremely important to know the anterior joint plane so anterior joint plane is just below and lateral to mid inguinal point remember this is the pubic tubercle sorry this is the symphysis pubis this is the pubic tubercle and that is the anterior sacroiliac spine the line joining the symphysis pubis to the anterior sacroiliac spine is known as the 
and the midpoint of that line is known as the mid inguinal point the line joining the pubic tubercle pubic tubercle to anterosuperior spine is known as the midpoint of the inguinal ligament because the inguinal ligament is attached from anterosuperior spine to the pubic tubercle okay you must be very clear about this because this often people get confused during examination so since this line is longer the line joining the pubic symphysis and uh, anterosuperior spine and this line is shorter so the midpoint of the inguinal ligament remains lateral compared to mid inguinal point okay clear anybody has got any doubt about this so your hip joint line is about 2 to 3 cm below and lateral to the mid inguinal point so this is the mid inguinal point so it remains below and it remains lateral so if you can palpate the femoral artery it remains just lateral to the femoral artery femoral artery will be somewhere here so when you examine the patient you first find out the pubic tubercle how to find pubic tubercle suppose in case of you know fatty patient sometimes you may not be able to appreciate a pubic tubercle so you adduct the limb against resistance so when you adduct a limb against resistance there is a contraction of the adductor longus muscle so you trace the adductors towards the origin or towards the top so adductor longus gets inserted into pubic tubercle and the point where you find that the bony prominence that is the pubic tubercle and from the pubic tubercle when you go superior laterally gradually the first bony prominence you feel is the anterior superior lax pain okay so that is how to you know trace the bony landmarks so your anterior hip joint line remains just below and lateral to mid inguinal point so anterior joint line anterior joint line is a 2 to 3 cm below and lateral to mid inguinal point mid inguinal point is the center of a line connecting the anterior superior spine and symphysis pubis so you must be able to answer it correctly and there you look for the anterior joint line tenderness now about posterior joint line then you go in a gradual manner in a orderly manner to do that you start with the anterior superior extension palpate then you go along the iliac crest then go to posterior superior iliac spine okay so there you might be seeing thickening of the suppose iliac crest there may be osteomyelitis there may be give you some idea okay sometimes bone graft has been taken some surgery has been done and there is a defect in the iliac crest so go in a particular order so first you have seen localize of temperature next you have seen anterior joint line tenderness examine the lymph nodes then from anterior superior iliac spine along the iliac crest go and palpate the posterior superior iliac spine then you come below to the greater trochanters and greater trochanters what you need to know the tip of the greater trochanters how to find the greater trochanters you slide both the hands from below upwards along the lateral aspect of the thigh so you slide the hands from below upwards along the lateral aspect of the thigh you will feel there is a bony prominence and gradually again you slide upwards when you feel the resistance is lost that is the tip of the greater trochanter that is the way you have to do in both the hands and you have to express when you are telling the examiner so the tip of the greater trochanter you have to see whether it is at the same level or some some uh, you know, on any side it has gone up whether there is a broadening thickening of the greater trochanter okay and or is there any tenderness of the greater trochanter remember the difference between broadening and thickening these words are extremely important while examination broadening means if there is a widening in any one direction it is known as broadening either anteroposterior or mediolateral but if there is a uniformly widen then it is known as thickening okay thickening occurs normally in osteomyelitis where broadening occurs in some kind of cyst okay simple bone cyst like this in one direction it is so broadening and thickening sometimes is asked in the examination so whether it's broadening thickening and whether the greater trochanter is tender or it's non tender next to palpate the edges margins and contour and you give a steady pressure by trochanteric pressure to look for the any hip joint pathology just to press on both the sides so if there is pain that means there could be some arthritis of the hip then you can see the circumference of the thigh and the calf muscle of course it will come in the measurements but this gives you an idea about the you know wasting of the muscles swelling swelling occurs in superative arthritis of the hip in the you know femoral triangle or there may be cold abscesses coming from different directions front and medial aspect of the greater trochanter medial side of the femoral vessels posterior in the gluteal region or in the pelvis due to perforation of the acetabulum so swelling you can feel also in the iliac fossa that is because of the abscess 
third point and last point in palpation is vascular sign of nara some examiners are very fond of asking this question okay though it is not important from clinical point of view how but uh, you must remember this vascular sign of nara that means you palpate the femoral artery and remember if you are able to palpate the femoral part artery the volume you should compare with the opposite side okay when you are palpating you palpate both the sides if the volume is equal on both the side that means vascular sign of narath is negative palpation of the femoral artery means vascular sign of narath is negative and if you are not able to palpate or the volume is low compared to the opposite side then you vascular sign of narath positive that means there is some pathology usually you palpate it against the you know head of the femur and if the head of femur is not in place like dislocated in case of congenital dislocation of the hip or any other conditions then vascular sign of nara becomes positive okay so this is often people confuse that the vascular sign of nara mm -hmm. negative vascular sign of nara positive and you know the relation of the vein artery nerve in the femoral triangle vein remains more medial then middle is the artery and nerve is the most lateral remember the vein that is the mnemonics so vein artery now where to palpate the femoral artery <coughs> next we come to movements which is extremely important in a hip case as you know hip joint is a you know ball and socket turn joint so there is flexion extension abduction adduction internal rotation external rotation and circumduction when you are asked what are the movements of the hip joint you have to tell circumduction though clinically when you examine you don't examine the circumduction but you have when you asked what are the movements then you have to add circumduction in shoulder in hip as well so these are the normal hip movements in sagittal plane coronal plane and vertical plane sagittal plane flexion in extended knee 90 degree flexion is possible because of the hamstring stretch when you flex the knee then hamstring gets relaxed so flexion can go until about 120 degree so how much normal flexion of the hip so you tell in flexion and in extension a extension of the knee normal extension is about 15 degree normally naturally when there is a flexion deformity you have to tell extension is zero and you don't have to check for the extension there in coronal plane normal adduction is about 30 degree 30 degree means the thigh or the affected thigh or the one thigh should cross the opposite side in the middle third that is about 30 degree of adduction suppose it crosses below middle third or crosses above middle third if it crosses above middle third that means the adduction is more if it crosses below middle third that means the adduction is less so adduction abduction is about 40 degree external rotation about 45 degree and internal rotation about 30 degree so your range of movement when you are expressing <coughs> when there are fixed deformities then you express it beyond the fixed deformities 30 degree of flexion deformity that is beyond how much flexion is present this is extremely important whenever you are checking for the you know movements the fixed deformities you tell at uh, first you find out the fixed deformities then you tell for the range of movement fixed deformity then you tell for the range of movements possible and for the range of active or passive movements and whether <coughs> it is associated with pain or not these are all the points you must touch in case of movements but question that the word of question that whenever you are seeing the movement first stabilize the pelvis when you are examining the movements and number 2 always compare with the normal side so this is fixed flexion deformity this i am telling you about thomas test remember if you are not able to perform thomas test then as a examiner examiner i will not pass you in the examination so more will be told about thomas test by pradeep in the next lecture but uh, you see if there is a flexion deformity of the hip normally it gets compensated with a increased lumbar lordosis so there is a compensatory spine deformity so because increased lumbar lordosis the hip appears to be flat or you can extend the hip to the normal level so when you flex the hip in one hand the opposite hip or the normal side the lumbar lordosis gets obliterated and flexor deformity becomes apparent and flexion deformity becomes apparent so how much to flex the normal limb is still the lumbar lordosis is obliterated remember you don't have to flex the hip completely okay sometimes after flexing about 40 degree the lumbar lordosis may get obliterated so that is the that is one important point that you have to flex the hip until the lumbar lordosis get the get obliterated 
So after lumbar lysis gets obliterated, you cannot be able to insinuate your hand, you know, between the couch and the patient. Okay. Till that time, you have to flex the hip and the amount of deformity which is there with the affected side, with the horizontal, is the amount of flexion deformity. So this is again, you can measure with a goniometer or the approximately also you can tell about 30 degree or 20 degree of flexion deformity. If there is exaggerated lumbar lordosis, thomastase is for fixed flexion deformity. Okay, thomastase is a very important test and as you can see here, that you may not be able to flex the hip completely in order to obliterate the lumbar lordosis. So, flex it till the lumbar lordosis gets obliterated, at that time what, how much of the angle is between the, you know, thigh and the couch, this is, this decides about the flexion deformity present in the hip and that is the fixed flexion deformity. Whenever there is a fixed flexion deformity, that means extension is zero, you have to write down. Sometimes examiner twists, they can ask, after the surgeon, now how much is the extension? Then you might not have examined, total extension is zero. Remember, after you see the flexion deformity, suppose a 20 to 30 degree, then you see how much is the further range of movement is present. Okay, how much further range of movement? Remember the active movement when the foot is off the bed and is doing active movement. How much further active range of movements is present? Then you press and do how much further passive range of movements is possible. So passive is done by the examiner, active is done by the patient. So active range of motion, then passive range of motion and then you tell whether it is associated with pain or not associated with the pain. Always mention if there is a painful or painless. So if I express suppose in a patient, so there is a 20 degree of fixed flexion deformity, further active range of movements is until about 90 degree and passively until about 110 degree which is painful. Okay, this is in one word you have told everything about the flexion deformity. Remember sometimes the patient tends to drag the feet. Whenever you tell the patient that you drag, you show the flexion, patient may drag the feet on the table to show the flexion. This is not, you know, active flexion. This is passive flexion because he is taking the support of the bed. Sometimes the examiner tends to, you know, drag your pull your leg to see that whether it's active flexion. No, this is not a active flexion because patient is dragging the foot on the on the bed. So when both hips are affected, then you can see individually the hips that you have to the Thomas test on one side, see the flexion deformity on the right side. Then you do Thomas test on the right side and see the flexion deformity on the left side. These are the questions which are asked in the exam so when there is both hip involvement. So both hip involvement, you can do Thomas test on either side or you can, when there is a fixed knee deformity, sometimes you know there is a pathology in the knee or there may be a knee contracture secondary to the hip deformity. So you have to take the patient to the edge of the bed so that knee deformity is obliterated. Then you can see with the Thomas test to see how much deformity is present as you can see here. So take the patient to the edge of the bed so that you obliterate the knee deformity. Or else you can test the flexion deformity in a prone position, make the patient prone so that you know knee is free so you can test that how much flexion deformity is there with respect to the horizontal. Okay, so these are the different methods to test uh, flexion deformity when there is a bilateral involvement, when there is a you know knee contracture, all these questions are asked in the examination. Next extension, you can take the patient to the edge of the bed, see for the extension or else you can make the patient in the lateral position and look for how much extension is present. If there is no flexion deformity in the hip, fixed flexion deformity, then you can test for the extension. Now you come to coronal plane deformity, fixed adduction or fixed abduction deformities. In fixed adduction and fixed abduction deformities, there will be compensatory, you know, scoliosis in the spine and because of the scoliosis of the spine there is a deformity of the pelvis or the anterior superior iliac spine can go up and can, can go down. So when the right side is affected and right side anterior superior iliac spine has gone up there is a adduction deformity. So in order to square the pelvis you have to adduct the limb further in order to bring both the anterior superior iliac spine to the same level. So this is known as squaring of the pelvis. Okay. Like if the right side affected, there is a abduction deformity. Abduction deformity, the anterior superior iliac spine remains at a lower level because of the you know scoliosis in the spine. In order to bring it to the level, then you have to abduct further, abduct further the limb so that you bring the both the anterior superior iliac spine to the same level. 
So if the abduction deformity, you abduct further. If the abduction deformity, you abduct further in order to square the pelvis. So squaring of the pelvis, like when you are doing squaring of the pelvis, this is the thumb and this is the middle finger. This is the widest span of the hand. Okay, <coughs> other fingers are small. So with the thumb and the middle finger, you palpate both these, you know, anteroceptive spines. Then you adjust the legs so that in order to square the pelvis. So next you measure the adduction. Adduction, as I told you, that uh, it crosses the middle third of the opposite thigh in a normal adduction. If it crosses below, that means there is a restriction of the adduction. You can measure the amount of adduction. Abduction, again, you have to stabilize the pelvis and take the leg out and measure the amount of abduction possible with a goniometer or you can roughly estimate that on eye estimation. Now rotations, internal rotation and external rotation, you have to first test it in extension, then you test it in the flexion. Okay. In extension, you measure the foot, how much foot is internally rotating or how much is the patella is internally rotating. Sometimes patella, you know, uh, is mobile, so you may not be able to assess properly, so you have to internally rotate the foot and see that how much rotation is present. Or keeping the hip in 90 degree and knee in 90 degree, you have to check the rotation. So internal rotation means your leg comes out, remember. Some people get confused in the examination. So internal rotation means your leg comes out like that. You have to hold and see the internal rotation. External rotation, again in extension, you measure with the foot or you can you know, flex the hip, flex the knee and when your leg goes in, this is the external rotation which is present. So if there is a restriction of the movement of the flexion, then you may not be able to measure the rotation in a flexed position, that's why you have to know that how much uh, rotation it is in, in extension. Sometimes there are differential rotations. In extension as well as in flexion, the rotations will be different. So there are two things you must remember. One is sectoral signs. When the hip joint is flexed to 90 degree, limb goes to external rotation. That means when you flex, you are not able to internally rotate. Whereas in extension, you are able to internally rotate. But when you flex the hip, then you are not able to internal rotation automatically leg goes to the external rotation that is known as sectoral side that means one part of the head is involved okay the axis deviation is another thing which is asked on full flexion of the hip and knee if the limb is directed to ipsilateral shoulder normally when you fully flex and hip and knee the knee should direct to the opposite shoulder but if it directs to the ipsilateral shoulder then there is axis deviation that means there is some sectoral involvement of the head then what are the conditions that we will discuss when we are presenting the cases. Just remember these are the two terms, differential rotations uh, due to sectoral involvement of the head. Rotations can al also be checked while the patient is in prone position, especially in children, sometimes make the patient prone and you see the rotation. So rotation can be seen in supine position with hip in extension, in you know flexion of the hip and in the you know prone position of the hip. This also you may not remember, it is not that important. Last part of the examination, we come to the measurements. Measurements, what you do, you measure the muscle wasting, you see the limb length disturbance, and all these brand triangles, Nelleton, Sumaker, signs, and Morris by trochanteric line, these are the lines you can draw in a, while doing the measurement. So, muscle wasting, how you examine, you take a fixed bony landmark, from there you measure a fixed point and put a mark there and there you measure the circumference that how much muscle wasting there. First do on the normal side, then, on the, then do on the abnormal side. So when the examiner tells you you must have marked it either from anterosophial spine or from the joint line, you take a fixed length on both the sides and measure the muscle wasting on both sides. So now we come to limb length distance the matter of apparent length and the true length. So apparent length the legs should be, both the legs should be parallel, remember. In true length, both the legs has to be in the same position. Okay. So, apparent length, you measure from a fixed bony landmark, either from the GP sternum or from the, you know, manogram sternum. And when both the legs are parallel, you measure the length from GP sternum to the tip of the medial malleolus on the both sides. Okay. Umbilicus has been written, but since umbilicus is not a fixed landmark, sometimes in a protuberant abdomen, umbilicus shift. That's why you have to take it from the GP sternum, the length of the uh, legs. That is the apparent length. And apparent length will be different from the true length in case of abduction or adduction deformities because of coronal plane deformity. So true length when the pelvis is squared. I told you how to make the pelvis squared. In case of adduction deformity, what you do? You further adapt the limb. 
in case of abduction deformity for the abductor limb okay in order to make the pelvis square so both the low, low limbs should be identical position sometimes you see there is a flexion deformity in the knee also so you have to keep the normal side knee also flexed to equal amount of flexion in order to measure the proper so both the legs should be in identical position whatever the knee position whatever the hip position remember that so identical measurement is from anteroceli expand again to medial malleolus now branch triangle is done to see whether the shortening or lengthening whatever is there is because of supratrochanteric or at intratrochanteric level you take a point in anteroceli expand that is the tip of the greater trochanter you join both the lines this is the first line you draw next from the anteroceli expand you draw a line perpendicular to the horizontal perpendicular to the horizontal this is done when the patient is in supine position and you measure the distance from the tip of the greater trochanter to this line this tells you about whether there is a and compare with with the normal side if there is a small or it is shorter then you tell there is a shortening of this much amount which is supratrochanteric okay so it tells you about to compare both the sides and uh, when there are bilateral pathologies then branch triangle is much not helpful then what is helpful <laughs> nelaton's line very good so this is nelaton's line which is drawn from the ischial tuberosity to anteroceli expand so in the lateral position from the ischial tuberosity to the anteroceli expand you draw the line the greater trochanter just touches this line suppose it goes up that means there is some shortening okay so you compare with both the sides this is known as shoe makers line though this you do not practice routinely in your you know clinical examination but from exam point of view at least you remember those lines because some examiners are got fancy of asking this lines so shoe makers line again the nelaton's line when you extend on both sides it should cross at the level or above the umbilicus okay both the lines when you extend the latent sign from ischial tuberosity to anteroceli expand extend it should cross above the umbilicus if it crosses below the umbilicus that means both sides it is shortening is there or greater trochanter has gone up but if it crosses lateral on this side or this side away from the midline that means that side the hip is affected that side the greater trochanter has gone up okay so normally lines meet at or above the level of umbilicus unilateral upward migration of greater trochanter lines will meet opposite side below the umbilicus okay if both sides then it will meet at the midline below the umbilicus so your you know uh, your concept should be very clear about this so make a slide so that you can tell the examiner science line normally it runs parallel you take you know bi trochanteric line join both the anteroceli and spine normally these two lines remains parallel to each other if it converges or diverges then that means the greater trochanter has gone up one side where it converges morris bi trochanteric line it is a line which can be shorter if there is a protrusion so draw a mid line join both the you know trochanters line you take from both the trochanters and join this line on the mid line this can be shorter if one side that means there is a protrusion or there is a central dislocation of the hip so that this line become shorter sometimes you know we must know about potteries angle actually potteries angle is not much importance but uh, some examiners also tend to ask draw a line in the mid line draw the line joining both the anteroceli leg spines and draw a line perpendicular to the mid line this is in case of adduction or abduction deformities the amount of movement or amount of abduction or adduction you do in order to square the pelvis is the amount of you know deformity which is present if you draw these lines then it is known as potteries line quarter is angle sorry quarter is angle tells you amount of abduction or adduction deformity which is present next last part is the special test trendel and bot test again in detail dr vijay is going to talk to you about active less uh, leg raising telescopy galeasy and otolanya and parlos test remember trendel and bot test the prerequisite is patient should be able to stand on supported for at least 30 seconds then only you will be able to test trendel and bot test suppose the patient is painful and unable to stand on one leg then what will happen you tell that trendel and bot test is not possible okay patient should be able to stand at least 30 seconds non supported in order to do trendel and bot test so when a patient stands on one leg what happens on this side of hip the abductor muscle contracts and it pulls the pelvis tilts the pelvis so that this side goes up normally okay 
But when there is a pathology of the abductor mechanism, then what happens? The pelvis will not go up, rather it will sink down. That is the whole purpose of tendon and test. Now this is a compensated tendon and test. Patient tries to balance the pelvis. Remember the spine has to be straight. If he is tilting the spine towards that side, that means it's not a, you may tell tendon, by mistake you should tell tendon and test is negative. So this is a compensated tendon and test. So if the pelvis sinks down, rather than it is going up, it sinks down, then there is some problem in the abductor mechanism and tendon and test is said to be positive. When it will be positive, so it will be three things. Either the muscles, the force, like the abductors, any affection of the abductors, like poliomyelitis, Duchenne's dystrophy, whatever. Then the liver arm. Liver arm is the trochanter and the neck of the femur. So intertrochanter fracture, or fracture neck of the femur, or coxa vara, or the fulcrum. Fulcrum is the hip joint. Hip joint, there may be dislocation of the hip or whatever. Okay. So, trenal blood test positive occurs in either defects of the fulcrum, defects of the liver arm or defects in the force, force abductor liver arm. So all these things can give rise to a positive renal test. Active straight leg testing, if the patient is able to do active straight leg raise until about 90 degree, there is a possibility that there may not be any hip injury or hip pathology. Okay, this is just roughly to estimate. Telescoping test, you make the hip make the hip 90 degree and knee to 90 degree, then you do a push and pull. Like, and you put your hand, it is extremely important while demonstrating telescopic test, you have to put your one finger there and the fingers are there. So that you feel the, you know, migration or excursion of the greater trochanter, tip of the greater trochanter. So, you have to hold in one hand the leg and other hand you have to stabilize the pelvis and palpate the tip of the greater trochanter. That is the telescopic test. Alizer Galeazi test usually done in children in order to see there is a short tibia or short femur. So you flex the hip, flex the knee, see the height of the knees. So if there is shortening anywhere, then Alice test or Galeazi test will be positive. Autolani Barlow's test you do in children in order to see there is a congenital dislocation of the hip. You know, remember what is the difference between Autolani and Barlow, often people get confused. In Autolani, you gradually abduct the hip, abduct the hip. So that hip gets reduced with a clunk, that is known as autolining test. Okay, autolining gradually abduct the hip in flex hip and knee so that the head gets reduced. Whereas in Barlow, you keep it in you know flexion and adduction and push and pull the hip. So the hip gets dislocated again reduced. Hip gets dislocated and again reduced. That is the Barlow's test. So Barlow's test in flex position you just see keep push and pull, whereas in autolining you gradually abduct the hip. This two test you must remember, you know, it's important. Then last you examine the gait, whether it is antalgic gait, trendal limbo gait, waddling gait, short leg gait, or high stepping gait, or in towing or out -towing. So, two important things about antalgic gait is that uh, it's a painful gait. So, there's a reduced stand space. So, patient doesn't put much of weight on that side and is try to take the weight off that hip. So, the shoulder droops to the opposite side in antalgic gait. Whereas in trendelin gait or a short limb gait, there is an increased stand space. That means patient tends to put more weight and stand space is more and patient should droop the shoulder to that affected side. <coughs> and whenever there is a both sides, then there is a waddling gait. Okay. So now we, <coughs> so at last, there my last slide. So to conclude, please do not forget to examine the hip. It is in uh, forget to examine the spine, the SI joint, and both the knees. Okay, quickly you examine before you come because there might be some pathology which you may miss. So you have to examine the spine quickly. You have to examine the SI joints and both the knees as well because there is a restriction of the movements of the you know knees. For rectal examination, in the examination usually we do not do, but it is important in cases of protrusio, at least when the examiner asks, then you should be able to tell and you tell correctly that I have not done a per rectal examination, but uh, if you have not done, then tell that you have not done a per rectal examination. But this